I have the pleasure of sitting here with, with Professor Joe Joseph Murray, mm -hmm. who won the Nobel Prize in 1990 for his work on organ transplantation. And if I can start this little talk and, and mm -hmm. say that it, from studying and from learning to know you, it is quite clear that medicine was always the uh, primary choice and that it was clear that you would become a physician from very early on. But my first question is really, when was it clear that you would be a researcher as well? What stimulated the early interest in research in you? Well, I think in medical school the professors were doing interesting work. I remember one uh, professor of pathology he was really an instructor in pathology, was studying inflammation. And I would look in the microscope with him and see different cells under circum different circumstances. I remember the trachina um, had eosinophils around it and an infection would have polymorphs. And I wondered how the body attracted one to a, a rather than another. And of course, this is ca caused by cytokines, we know now. But this was back in 1941, and there was no knowledge of intercellular reaction. So that interested me. And then it was reinforced in my World War II experiences when we used skin from dead persons to cover burns mm -hmm. in patients. Uh, and we knew that the skin would last, survive, for maybe three weeks or four weeks, but eventually it would melt away. Whereas if his own skin had been used, the skin would have grown and then permanently survived and actually grown. And I wondered how the body could be so smart as to distinguish between a piece of skin which to you and me would look the same would treat one differently from another. So those were the two biological observations that were in the back of my mind. You came to the Valley Fort shortly after you graduated from Harvard, yes. I suppose, and got a lot of clinical experience Absolutely. immediately. Yes, we had battle casualties from all theaters, the European, African, and the Pacific. We also cared for German prisoners of war Italian, Italian was prisoners of war as well, mm. in the same hospital, and they received the exact same treatment. Mm. And problems associated with transplantation, there was uh, the first one of those that you saw was a, was a Burns treatment and the yes. difficulty in, in transplanting skin from, right. from unrelated right. individuals. Uh, I suppose a few years earlier there had been skin transplantation between identical twins. Oh yes, that was 1934 or 5. Mm -hmm. A surgeon, a plastic surgeon in St. Louis, uh, treating burns, mm -hmm. found that if skin came from relatives, it would survive longer than if it came from an unrelated person. And so he quite reasonably felt that if, if a related person has better survival, maybe an identical twin will have better survival. And he actually found a pair of identical twins and cross skin grafted them, and he got permanent survival. And that was the only type of survival that we knew in the 1930s. And then you went, and, and my next question relates to how, what was the process between the Burns treatment in the Valley Ford and the kidney transplantation. How did you focus on kidney and kidney transplantation? Well, it was quite logical. When I finally got out of the Army and I finished my residency in the late 1970, um, no. When did we get out of the Army? The night? 47. 40, I'm 40, on 49. Yeah. 49, yeah. 49. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I finally got out in the late 40s, um, I joined the kidney transplant team at the Brigham. It was all, already in operation. And so I joined them, and rather than transplanting skin, 
it was more fun to transplant kidneys because you had the vascular anastomosis yeah. to do, the ureter implantation, and you could tell when the kidneys stopped functioning. So uh, I just, it was a natural transition to use the kidney as a biological indicator rather than a piece of skin. But our research used both skin and kidneys throughout. Mm -hmm. Was the animal experimentation, the transplantation in dogs, was that going on already when you arrived? There? Uh, no, but um, I started a large series of dog transplants and also with mice, rabbits, all sorts of animals. Mm -hmm. And based on that you performed the first transplantation yes. between the identical twins? Well, in the course of operating on dogs, I figured if we didn't have a good operation mm. that would work in genetically s uh, similar persons, mm. it would be no use. And so I developed a surgical technique in uh, dogs that was reproducible and could uh, function normally. Mm. So I had a whole group of dogs surviving on one transplanted kidney back to himself. Mm. It was an isogenous transplant, mm. but there was no um, uh, genetic barrier. Mm. And then, of course, the big, big uh, jump or, or the major development was going from the identical twins to, uh, to genetically unrelated people. Well, yes, but before that, we had to show that in man, the identical twin transplant would work. Right. And we happened to get a set of identical twins, mm -hmm. yes. one of whom was dying of a kidney disease, the other healthy. Mm -hmm. And that took about two years to really work it up and get the ethics and the morals and the acceptance of the community. Mm -hmm. We went to uh, doctors at other hospitals. We consulted clergymen of all denominations. Mm -hmm. We went to corporate uh, executives to try to get a feeling for what the general public would feel mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we knew we were doing something <clears throat> experimental mm -hmm. and we just wanted to inform as wide a variety of society as possible. Mm -hmm. And then in the uh, during these early days you investigated various methods of immune suppression yeah. including ionizing radiation. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> Where was the breakthrough coming, would you say, with immune suppression that well, would... The, the real break came with the development of drug immune suppression. However, we had had some success both in animals and in humans with total body irradiation. And um, we, have, we actually had one set of brothers with a permanent kidney survival with an allogeneic um, kidney mm. treated with x-ray therapy, but we started to do a series of 12 humans and one d did very well. Several of them did well for a while, but then they would, uh, after five or six weeks, would reject the kidney. Mm -hmm. We needed something more predictable and fortunately at that time the drug 6 mercaptopurine and its derivative as the thioprin came along. Mm -hmm. And that was synthesized, as you know, by doctors Hitchings yes. and Elian um, from Burroughs Welcome. Mm. And they were very helpful mm. to us. They sat in with us, educated yeah, us about yeah, biochemistry. Yeah. Yeah. They saw our patients. They knew our dogs mm. by names. And uh, soon we had uh, long-term surviving dog kidneys, allogeneic kidneys. Mm. It's very interesting to hear because I, I've learned from you that you had occasional or you had regular visits, I think, by MedAware early and then your long-standing collaboration with Hitchings and Eden. Yes, and so, yes. And my question there is, did you have to, to stimulate uh, the, our colleagues, our immunology colleagues to come or was it obvious? <laughs> did you have to recruit them, so to say? Uh, or? Uh, that's a wonderful <laughs> question because our local immunologists were not interested. They were, they tolerated our interest. Uh -huh. They'd say, Joe, you can't do it. Why don't you wait until, until we solve the problem? But they, they did not attempt to discourage me. They just said, it won't work. <laughs> it wasn't until Peter Medawa, who visited 
frequently. Um, he'd come to our lab, he'd see some of our patients in the hospital, and he was enthused that a group of clinicians, especially surgeons, were interested in the biological problem. And I think that uh, he came to Harvard Medical School to give a series of lectures, and he spent quite a bit of time in our lab, and the immunologist wondered why. <laughs> oh, <I see. laughs> a prophet is without honor in his own country. Yes. But uh, once we uh, got going and showed some good laboratory results, our own department um, became supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, our own immunology department mm -hmm. came, became supportive. Mm -hmm. But an important thing was we had the support of our chiefs of the clinical service. The chief of medicine was really behind it, Dr. Thorne, and Dr. Moore, our chief of surgery, supported us in every way, including finances. And uh, so uh, we developed a nice, fun team. Yeah. Coming back to the theme of the, today's panel discussion, which was extremely interesting, and so I would like to, to ask you, if, uh, also, because we know that, that some people objected to this uh, mm -hmm. development of, of uh, medicine and surgery at the time, and so uh, well, did you experience much uh, opposition or so that people came up and told you that this one shouldn't do such things as transplant organs between different individuals or so? Both yes and no. Mm -hmm. Some of my closest friends at the medical school faculty, I was young then, just got out of the army, advised me not to get involved because they said it would ruin my career. Mm -hmm. But others were supportive. And uh, the ones that uh, gave some warnings didn't forcefully stop me. They just, mm -hmm. they warned me in a friendly way. Mm -hmm. But I guess as you have said, it was very important that the first operation was successful. Absolutely. We had done the operation in dogs many times. Mm -hmm successfully, but when the twins came, it had to work. And we didn't know whether the exact anatomy of the human was going to be receptive to a transplanted kidney. Mm -hmm. So we went to the pathology department during a post-mortem exam about a week or so before the operation and transplanted a kidney in the anatomy lab all the way through, from the beginning to the end. We wanted to be sure the blood vessels would work well, the ureter would fit into the bladder, and uh, so we prepared as well as we could. Mm. What, uh, obviously your own career shows the importance uh, very clearly of intense and, and the collaboration between clinical research and preclinical research, and, yes. and the fact yeah. that we can work together and I know that you have been a prophet of, for that ever since. Yes. So yeah, yeah. This is, I think, a problem that exists in many medical universities and medical mm -hmm. schools to get enough collaboration between the preclinical scientists <laughs> and the clinical sciences. Let me give Do you, you have any. <laughs> let me give you an amusing incident. For today's panel, mm -hmm. we had a breakfast meeting a few days ago. I see. Yeah. And one of the persons on the, in the panel, I won't mention who, very fine person said that a physician can never be a scientist. And I didn't say anything, but <laughs> I don't know how they define science unless it's somebody who doesn't work with patients. But uh, I, I hear that all the time, and I have been a prophet of clinical investigation. Because people ask, why did we keep on when there were so many failures? Well, it was the patients who were dying, and most of them were young, in their early 20s, and uh, the families knew that we were experimenting, and actually, even though they didn't expect success, they said, it may not help us, but it may help someone in the future. And it gave me an indication of the wonderful generosity of human nature. That is, uh, no, that is really wonderful. So, uh, staying for a moment with, with preclinical and clinical, clinical medicine, I, I would again uh, 
I would ask you something that, that relates to, to the Nobel Prize and some discussion which comes up now and then, obviously, mm -hmm. and which was obvious in, in some of the, of the journeys last year, and that is the question of preclinical prizes or prizes to basic science mm -hmm. versus prizes to mm -hmm. clinical science and mm -hmm. to, to clinical medicine. Yes. And I think that we all have the many of us have a feeling that it would be very nice to be able to give more prizes to, to clinical medicine. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, that clinical medicine is sometimes neglected? In oh yes, I, I definitely do. I think Pasteur has a wonderful quotation that there is only one science, basic science and clinical, and they are locked together like the trunk of a tree to the branches. And they're all forms of seeking knowledge. And I think that when, one th when a person feels that he or she must be in the laboratory to make scientific progress is, um, is stultifying their vision. And uh, so I feel very strongly that we, in the clinical side, have certain advantages because we see patients who um, have problems that need solving, that the bench scientist is never going to see. Uh, so um, I feel very strongly that it would be a great loss to society if clinicians were not also research-minded. Uh, mm. Thank you very much. I think that is a very, very nice conclusion of, okay. of uh, our talk now, uh, unless there is something that you feel that I have missed or, well, or yeah, well, not remembered or which well, you would like to add. We can well, yes, you asked a on. question about um, are there subjects that might have been missed by the Nobel Committee. And I feel very strongly that cardiac surgery has developed tremendously in the past 30 or 40 years. It has saved hundreds of thousands of lives. And I think that the pioneers in cardiac surgery were mostly surgeons, ph physiologically oriented. And I, I have nominated several of them, and obviously there are good reasons why they didn't, were not selected. But I think that the Nobel Committee should at least search out for clinical investigators, whether it's respiratory physiology or gastrointestinal or um, endocrine. Uh, I th there are many areas that could be recognized. Thank you. I think with this advice, <laughs> we conclude this interview. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, thank, you thank you for, so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.